Fins with Robohub, the podcast for news and views on robotics. Hello and welcome to the Robohub podcast. In today's episode, we will hear from Benjamin Pietro Filardo, CEO and founder of Pliant Energy Systems. As you may guess from its name, this organization did not start out as a robotics company. Instead, Pliant Energy Systems was originally focused on developing a new way to generate electricity from the flow of water by using a specially designed fin, an approach that presents multiple advantages over traditional turbines and rotors, which they did successfully. It was only after demonstrating that the company could build effective fins for energy harnessing that the team at Pliant decided to turn their fins into propellers for a robot developing a novel form of actuation. This robot, now called Velox, is able to travel in water, on land and on ice. Our interviewer Abate found out more for us when he spoke to Pliant CEO and founder. Hey there, welcome to RoboHub. Thank you. Um, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Pietro Filardo and I'm the founder and CEO of Pliant Energy Systems. We're based in Brooklyn. We are a, both a renewable energy and a robotics company, specifically marine robotics. That's really cool. What's your, uh, what's your background? Why did you initially start this company? Well, my background is not typical, um, but I find in the field of robotics that people come from all kinds of backgrounds. So I, I studied marine biology and oceanography, and then I went into design and I studied architecture and I worked in architecture. When I returned to some renewable energy concepts, I had Jason. Sorry about that. I returned to this energy concept I had while studying marine biology and oceanography, observing the power of water and the power of waves. And uh, I had some concepts that I thought about back then that I put aside while I pursued a career in architecture, while always maintaining an interest in in, in technology and engineering. Uh, and then a few years ago, my brother Frank sent me a paper on something called the dielectric elastoma, which is, to make a long story short, it's a composite material, sometimes referred to as a smart material, that if you stretch and relax it, you can turn the material strain into electrical energy. Conversely, if you apply charge to this material, you can get it to expand and contract. And this was a big deal in the 90s. People were thinking we finally have an artificial muscle, we can get nonlinear actuators um, and we can have a nonlinear mechanical system to harness, uh, to create electricity. And it, 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 that was the inspiration for starting the company was to find a way to harness the flow of rivers and streams, so directional fluid flow, using this new material called the dielectric elastomer. Um, at the time, Dielectric elastomer generators for, uh, for water power applications were taking linear mechanical systems, conventional linear mechanical systems, such as a water wheel, and attaching it with, a, say, an asymmetrical crankshaft to a piece of dielectric elastomer. So the, the, the wheel spins just as the water wheel always did spin, and in the process, the shaft stretches and relaxes, and relaxes a piece of a section of dielectric elastomer material. Um, so my thinking was that because we had this new nonlinear uh, material, something that, that is being strained and relaxed to create electricity, uh, what would the, what kind of a structure, what would the overall system architecture look like for a dielectric elastomer generator? Uh, and so I started looking at nonlinear mechanical systems to harness nonlinear mechanical generator. and. My first conceptions were uh, for capturing the fluid flow of streams and rivers. Uh, and I filed some patents on, on these concepts. And to my surprise, the patents got, got granted, several of them, fairly quickly. And then I applied for funding um, to a couple of different government agencies. And to my surprise, I got the funding. These were the SPIR programs, the Department of Defense. Um, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture and also uh, New York State uh, uh, funded us. So with this grant funding um, and a little bit of private capital, 
I was able to hire my first employees and start doing some R&D and start turning these, what had really been concepts sort of imagined, uh, you know, visually, conceptually imagined and modeled geometrically, but not modeled uh, analytically uh, in my mind um, to actually explore some of them uh, with people, you know, people first hires, a couple of PhDs, one in, uh, uh, one within mechanical engineering to actually people with the tools and the expertise to put some of the things that I'd conceptualized into practice. And in particular, Dr. Dan Zimmerman, an experimental physicist and the designer, Michael Week. Um, it remarkably, it was, to me, it was remarkable at the time that these conceptions were actually real. They could, they were realizable. Um, funding for the Austin Naval Research to develop a, a generator for streams, currents, and we built it and it worked. Can you describe how it looked for us? Yeah, so the, the essential innovation that Plant Energy has been working on all this time is a, uh, it is, it, it's an undulating member. So it's like a fin of, let's just say, you know, a knife fish, they have that long fin under the belly that the traveling wave undulation passes through the fin or a, a cuttlefish or a stingray that sort of traveling undulation through a fin, uh, that is what you see in both our generator, our energy harnessing technology, and most significantly, because it's where we've made the most progress in our robotics system. So essentially, we have developed a new type of transducer. It's a transducer that takes the form of a flexible, undulating traveling wave. And just as a, an airplane propeller, for example, uh, interacts with fluid to create thrust. A wind turbine is really the is really the techno, is really the inversion of that. So, in a wind turbine, rather than consuming energy to create thrust with the with the propeller blades, in a wind turbine, it's a passive system that receives receives kinetic energy from fluid flow, air, in the case of a wind turbine, and converts that into electrical energy. So, a wind turbine and a fan or a turboprop are really same uh, opposite side of the same technology coin. So fine energy's undulating fin, when it's working in generator mode, it's really acting like the blades of a wind turbine, except that rather than rotating, the fluid flow creates positive negative pressures along the length of the fin, and that causes the undulation to travel, and you turn that undulating action, that mechanical undulating action into electrical energy or into some other kind of useful mechanical work, such as a pump. In the generator mode, you take that same fin and you actuate the fin. So you, you induce traveling waves to pass along the fin, consuming energy to do that, batteries in our case, that creates a propulsive thrust in the water. And what we found is that the we, as I started saying, we got funding from the Austin Naval Research to do a generator, and it worked. But you know, there's a there's a there's an infinite number of ways to generate electricity, but it has to be cheap and it has to be robust. Um, what we thought our energy harnessing mechanism had in its favor for rivers and streams was it, that it would be robust. Uh, so, bladed systems in a fluid flow, like if you an undammed unregulated waterway, such as a, a naturally flowing river or stream. Uh, the typical approach is to put what's essentially an upside down windmill, excuse me, a submerged, is to put a submerged windmill essentially uh, attached to the riverbed and the water flows over the blades and makes it spin, turns a turbine. Um, the problem with that system, and there's been a lot of effort put into it over many years, is that unregulated waterways Inevitably, it's just a matter of time before a tree trunk or a branch or a, some other debris will impact the blades. Uh, up in with wind turbines, you don't really have that problem. You're up in the cleave, in a clear free, free air. You know, you might kill a boat or two. There might be a fluke airplane or, or drone collision, but up in the air, it's clear skies, uh, except there's a hurricane or something. Whereas in the water, if it's a naturally flowing river, which is the idea with these with these systems to avoid the expense of building dams and so forth. Is there, it, the object, your, your energy harnessing 
mechanism object has to be able to withstand anything that comes uh, down the river. And bladed systems tend to get broken or they tend to tangle in the water. Um, they get wrapped up with cable or fishing line if they're small. So our system, because it doesn't rotate, because it undulates, and because it is attached to a tether like a kite, rather, uh, and, and the whole system is in tension and it's self-reacting, you need very little secondary structure in order to, for it to operate. It doesn't need to be rigidly coupled to a stiff mast, a stiff mast that's in the, 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 the riverbed that will be able to withstand impact from the occasional heavy object. So the idea was it deflects heavy objects, uh, doesn't require expensive uh, foundations or moorings to attach itself. And so that all worked, it all worked as expected, but it, there wasn't a, a clear path at that time to how to make this generator uh, low cost uh, and, uh, and, and robust in other ways. So it won't break, but there was an awful lot of engineering work would be required um, to bring the power up. So we sort mm -hmm. of, Put that aside for a while. The, the Navy became very interested in its obvious applications as a marine propulsion system, specifically for a small robotic system. So a colleague and I took a trip down to the Office of Naval Research Headquarters in Arlington, Virginia, um, and we talked to a program officer there, Dr. Tom McKenna. Within moments, he realized the significance of what we were doing and we got some, uh, we submitted an unsolicited proposal and we started working on the robot. So the Navy has been primarily funding the robotic system uh, since then. And we, uh, we developed the robot that, that some people have seen, the prototype is called Velox, and the next generation will be called Sea Ray. The mm -hmm. characteristics of, so I'm looking, I'm thinking of some, what are the advantages of a robot that has undulating fins instead of propellers. And I would say that the undulating fin concept for a marine robotic system has been around for a long time. People have tried for, for years to, to design and implement an undulating fin that has the high efficiency and some of the other benefits, which we can touch on later, of an undulating fin versus a propeller. Uh, we were the first ones to, I guess, crack the secret of how to create an efficient undulating fin drive. Uh, we did that through, you know, it, it's essentially a solid mechanics, a continuum mechanics problem. Uh, so we developed the first fin that is very efficient. So the amount of electrical energy that goes into the mechanical energy to move the fin, we get a very high uh, static thrust. So the static thrust, the thrust per watt is very good. And that is what was observed in some uh, uh, aquatic animals that had these traveling wave fins. It was observed that they get an awful lot of thrust through a very little uh, consumption of power, which you can you can measure by looking at the oxygen consumption rates in a, in, a, in the water where the fish is swimming. Um, is your is your system comparable to the biological system's energy efficiency? Yeah, we, we, it's it's yes, it is, and it's it's in some ways it may be even better. Um, but we, we have yet to prove just how efficient it can be. It's a, a question of continuum mechanics and also some pretty clever, some pretty fancy geometry, pretty complex geometry to get the fin to behave in the way you want it to. Uh, you know, it's a, it's essentially a four dimensional object, our fin, because with the fourth dimension, of course, being time, because it doesn't have any, any fixed static position. So the fin undulations move very easily along the fin and the fin can be in an almost infinite number of configurations within certain boundary conditions, as opposed to uh, you know, a, fit, a, a propeller blade, whether it's on a turbine or it's on a, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a boat that has a shape that you move. This shape is indeterminate, shall we say. Um, that's sort of the secret of why this fin is so effective. Um, Can you, you describe how those fins are um, actuated, like where the motors are? Are there multiple fins on this robot per se? Yeah, so the, the robot that we've developed has two fins, and the ones that we anticipate developing down the future have two fins. And that gives you, uh, we've already established the high efficiency of the fins. When you have two of them, you uh, either side of a symmetrical body, 
you get extremely high maneuverability. And this was one of the things that, that was very, uh, very intriguing to the Office of Naval Research. Um, because we have, in addition to thrust vectoring, which is what you get with the propeller, we also have drag vectoring. So you have these large, uh, these fins that have a larger surface area interacting with a large amount of water. So the fins, when the traveling wave is moving along the fin, it moves a large volume of water, but fairly slowly, rather than a propeller, which spins very fast, typically, uh, and moves a small jet of water very fast. So that means that these fins are very quiet, and it's partly why they're so efficient. We don't get cavitation, we don't get vortex-induced vibrations. Drag vectoring is key to their maneuverability because if the robot, let's just say, is moving forward with both fins actuated in a straight line, if one fin stops, the robot will now pivot around its center point. Uh, and it means that you can use drag to control your direction, your velocity, and your position uh, as much as you can use thrust because you're interacting with a large surface area of water so if the robot is moving forward, both fins are undulating, and then the undulations stop, the robot will stop almost instantly because the large surface area of its fins create a lot of drag. And then if the, the fins go into reverse, the robot can now move backwards at the same speed as moving forward almost instantaneously, where with the propeller-driven system, you have to have, you have to wind up and wind down, speed up uh, and, and slow down and uh, propellers and propellers don't work backwards as well as they do forwards, whereas our fins are, are pretty, uh, they don't care if it's forward or backwards. So we have two fins per robot. The, what we proved is that these fins can be created. Um, we, we did thousands of hours of numerical modeling to get to where we are. And we proved that they have their high efficiency and we demonstrated a robot with two of these fins has very high maneuverability with a very low energy budget. In terms of how to make them in the, the fin move, in terms of how to actuate the fin, we, there are many ways to do that. And we've explored several ways. Um, the prototype Velux that you've seen uses a series of servos. The next uh, version, which we hope will be the one we bring to market, uh, does not use uh, servos in that manner. Exactly how we do it, you know, that's something that we would, that we'll, we keep close to our chest. We have explored uh, even using a fluidic drive to make the fins undulate. So rather than having uh, electric motors, we have a series of pumps. Um, and that's, that's an alternative way to do it that would make it even quieter. So to have an almost silent um, marine robot, which is something obviously the military is interested in, to not have the, the vortex used vibrations, to not have the cavitation of a rapidly spinning propeller, and then also to not to have the whir of the motor uh, you've got a very quiet, uh, stealthy robot, which um, I think that's of interest also to the to the Navy. The most I can see a lot of uses for, say, military and Navy. Um, do you have any descriptions of uses outside of the, the military and Navy that could also benefit from this? Yes, we do. There are, it's a, it's a completely new system. Like, as I mentioned, people have tried to do undulating fins, but because none of them work well, no one's really explored the different applications. We've had a chance to look at different applications and see just what these fins are good for. And one of the things we found out during the, the, the Navy funded research is that the way we design these fins is that they work on land as well as in water. So obviously a propeller is useless on land. If you want to have an amphibious vehicle with propellers for the water, it's going to have to have wheels or something when it gets to the beach or tracks. We have, uh, with our robotic system, the same fins that are very effective at moving through water, both in terms of efficiency and in terms of maneuverability, can also move over land. So it doesn't really like to move over land, right? It's a little uncomfortable, but it can do it. So it can swim efficiently, efficiently long distances in the water, and then it can move up out of the water onto land. Um, it can do it tolerably. It sort of crawls along. It, it, in the water, it's like a cuttlefish or a stingray. On land, the movement movement of the fins is more like um, it's more like a, a millipede with an infinite number of legs. So the wave undulations move forward when it's uh, traveling on land, and the wave undulations move backwards when it's in the water. The most surprising property that we found, with implications for how it, the, what the technology could be used for, 
is the fins make an excellent ice skating mechanism. To the best of our knowledge, um, this is the first truly ice skating robot in that the fins, which have, uh, the fins use anisotropic friction in the way that an ice skater does. So in the water, it's efficient. On land, it's manageable. On ice is probably the most efficient mode of all. And so you have this one set of fins that's swimming through the water can crawl across sand, dirt, mud, pebbles, and then can glide over ice. And the, the, the backward travel of the undulations on ice is almost the same speed as the forward progress of the robot, which means very high efficiency. We haven't actually done, uh, we haven't quantified it in detail, um, but we have uh, qualitatively observed ridiculously high efficiency on ice, which is sort of what you expect actually um, when you think about um, if somebody's on ice skates and you give them a shove, you both go backwards and you keep moving for a long time because there's very little friction, right? So we have that applications for its ice skating ability, obviously ice rescue, scientific uh, explore, explorations, um, polar scientific applications, um, polar exploration, polar prospecting. Um, I think that uh, We've had interest from various scientists in its polar applications. Um, research scientists who uh, have an issue with their expert, with the research they're doing, where you have, because of climate change, you have lakes and rivers appearing uh, where the, that are one not on any map last year. So we have a, a rover that can travel over the ice, uh, getting, gathering data, uh, and then if it comes across a lake in the ice or river, it can swim through it and then continue on its way. Now, when it's on ice, are the fins still at the side? Um, do they do they move around? Um, is it exactly the same uh, orientation of the robot as it goes across these three different environments? The only change between ice and water is the fins go down. So the fins are out to the side when it's through the water. Most of the time, the fins can be down or up but most of the time the fins will be out the side while traveling through the water. On ice, the fins are pointing straight down. They're overall pointing straight down because the individual undulations move side to side, but the net direction of the fin is, is, is tilting down. Uh, when it's moving over, over solid ground, the fins are at a sort of in between the swimming mode and the ice mode. They're sort of out to, at an angle to one side. Mm -hmm. So other applications that you mentioned beyond the, the, the obvious military ones that you asked about, um, we think that in the civilian market that a big opportunity is with uh, sewer inspection, culvert inspection, pipeline inspection, where you have a mixture of fluids and solids. So it's not particularly glamorous, but the US has 800,000 miles of sewer line. Uh, and to be able to send a robot that can swim through the watery parts and then crawl or burrow through the solid parts is a, is a key advantage. There are vehicles that do that now. They tend to be either they have propellers or they're tracked, they attract heavy crawlers. And the obviously the propeller driven uh, vehicles, and by the way, most of these are remotely operated with a tether. Um, and then you have the uh, uh, remotely operated tracked vehicles for exploring these environments and they, um, they can get stuck fairly easily. Uh, and they also cannot swim up to look at, say, the top of the tunnel to inspect what's happening there. They're, they're gravity based and they're, they're down on the ground, down on the bottom of the pipe, plowing through whatever, whatever is there. So that's a, that's a significant civilian market. You also think there are applications in uh, coastal research, uh, coastal uh, science, uh, monitoring water quality, uh, monitoring uh, environmental conditions, because we don't have to worry about are getting tossed up on the beach by a wave and then being stranded. We don't have to worry about getting stuck in mud because the robot is very good at mud. And we can go through swamps and we can swim or crawl when we come across a swamp or marshy area. Whereas other uh, remotely operated vehicles or autonomous vehicles for coastal environments, either they swim through the watery part or they mostly use tracks uh, to crawl through the, through the um, through the swampy parts, through the muddy, marshy areas. Uh, well, we can do both and we don't run the risk of getting stuck in mud the way a, a tracked crawler would. And I think that's another area that, that the military is 
pointed to that they're interested in is um, uh, checking, uh, is um, surveying for unexploded ordnance. Uh, it's, it's, it's a, historically, the US used uh, swamplands and marshlands for, uh, as artillery firing ranges. And there's a lot of land now uh, that is filled with uh, unexploded ordnance that is that the, the Department of Defense wants to decommission and hand over to the public for, you know, for a recreational use to make them into parks and so forth, but they, they're too dangerous to do that. Um, so using our robotic system to travel through swamps and marshes to identify uh, uh, mines and other exploded ordnance shells so that the land can be returned to other uses is, is a potentially uh, important application, both in terms of um, in terms of being very effective and also reducing the risk of having people have to do that task, which is very time consuming and, and, and obviously very dangerous. If one of our robots comes up, it's not the end of the world. How does the, uh, how does the robot scale? Are there multiple different sizes? Could you um, make a robot, say, the size of a computer mouse um, and have it go through very small sewer lines just as easily as you could have something, say, uh, the size of a killer whale? Yeah, that's a, the scaling question is one we've looked at a little bit. In terms of going down in scale, we can absolutely go down smaller and smaller. How we would engineer the, the, the um, how we'd engineer the transmission system would change. If we're going to make it very small, but it definitely can get very small. We've had inquiries from, uh, there's a company in India that would like a very small robot to look, to swim around the oil inside the, um, uh, they have these transformers that are fluid filled and they would like to be able to send a robot in there. Uh, and because we can swim through viscous fluids, oil uh, or mud, um, that's an application for a very small robot that people have made requests. Uh, if we could design one for them. When it comes to scaling up uh, on land, it's going to be more challenging to make them very heavy. Um, you know, it's no coincidence that the largest organisms uh, live in water. And as you start to get very large on land, um, structural issues become, uh, become challenging. So we think in terms of scaling up uh, in the ocean, in water, we think about body lengths per second. So if we take a robot that's one meter long and it has one wave cycle of undulations along it, we can only go so fast before the wave undulations are traveling at a speed that's, that's somewhat impractical. We double the size of the robot, becomes two meters long instead of one meter long. Um, we think the speed will double. So potentially a very large robot could achieve high speeds. It wouldn't look from a distance like it, the fins are moving that fast because there's sort of an optimal efficiency for how fast the fins move relative to their size. So to get speed, we just scale up. And the blue whale, for example, is one of the fastest swimmers uh, in the oceans, and its tail is you know, moving gently along, but it's moving at tremendous speed. On land, it's going to be harder to scale. We don't know what the limits are. Part of the upper weight limit on land will be determined by what more we can do with the fins. Um, our, it is possible we can make the fins withstand heavier loads than we currently think, but that's, that's ongoing uh, research. And I understand that um, this company, you're still mostly in an R&D mode, correct? You're not currently selling directly to any customers. No, we're not selling to any customers yet. We had a lot of, uh, we had a lot of inquiries from customers. It's, an, it's been an interesting uh, sort of uh, pre-marketing uh, opportunity we've had with, the, with some of the PR we've gotten, uh, various uh, stories and publications and YouTube channels and so forth. Uh, it's been interesting to see who gets in touch with us and who wants to buy one and wants to know more about them. And we have people, uh, for example, in aquaculture. One very interesting example was a large Indonesian shrimp farmer who needed to be able to inspect their shrimp pools. The problem they have with existing uh, robotic systems is that propellers would uh, turn the, the, the nymph shrimp, the very small shrimp, into puree. So then they put screens over the propellers to try to stop the shrimp from being drawn into the propellers and then the, the screens would just get blocked. So he, would, he was interested in having 
you know, one of our robots that could go down and swim amongst the uh, shrimp and inspect the shrimp, take samples, see what's happening on the bottom, see what food they're eating or not eating without actually, you know, without ch chopping up the, the shrimp. That's one example. Uh, we had uh, contact by seaweed farmers, quite a few uh, search and rescue operations, uh, ice rescue, some, um, some EMT uh, uh, organizations from different parts of the world have contacted us. Um, and I mentioned the, the uh, industrial company in India that's looking for a small robot that can swim through the fluid, through the oil in the uh, transformer stations. And we've had some marine scientists contact us about the ice skating ability for polar science. And we've had a lot of people in the, also from around the world in uh, culvert inspection, drain inspection, and so forth. You can see that see the limits of the equipment that they have so far and see this is potentially filling up uh, filling a gap in, in their capabilities mm -hmm. and do you ever see a world in which this could be used um this undulating fin as a form of propulsion for a vehicle that carries people in the water potentially so the advantage of this undulating propulsion system for a surface ship for example um, you know, a, a, a prop on the shaft, the motor is a pretty mature technology. It's, it's pretty good in many ways. The fin is not as simple to construct and fabricate as a, a prop spinning on a shaft, right? So it's more complex than a propeller by its, with a shaft and a motor, right? So there have to be some specific reasons why you would need that for a like, surface scroll. One example is very shallow water or environmentally sensitive waters, where rather than having a, uh, a boat with a propeller that's you know, chopping up, mixing up sediment, uh, chopping up uh, plant life, seagrass and so forth, uh, you have something that has a more gentle interaction with the environment. So, you know, in Florida, they have, you know, they lose a few hundred manatees every year from, uh, from propeller strikes. So you can see how um, in environmentally sensitive waters that you might, uh, might say no propeller boats allowed beyond this point beyond that point would have to be a boat that had our undulating fin because it would be harmless to the manatee uh and you know you can go up against one of these fins while it's actually you can grab it you can bump up against it it just doesn't doesn't do anything to you at all uh also because we the fin moves large amounts of water slowly as opposed to a rapidly spinning propeller that creates a small jet of water we will be kicking up less sediment there's less concentrated kinetic energy in the wake of our propulsor as compared with the propeller. So there are some there are some scenarios where you might use it on a surface ship. In a submarine, there's no reason why it couldn't be scaled up. A human carrying submarine, there's no reason why it couldn't be scaled up. Such a submarine would have high maneuverability. So there's an analogy, not a perfect one, that can be made between the fin and a propeller as opposed to a caterpillar track and a wheel. Um, so we get very good traction, quote unquote, in the water because we have this large surface area, we make contact with a large surface area, which means that a large vehicle with very large fins would be able to turn very quickly and would be able to change direction and move at a fairly high velocity using you know, a large heave effect rather than a spinning, uh, spinning propeller. And so you might see, for example, like an underwater excavator uh, with a, a human operation underwater excavator with these fins instead of a propeller because you get instantaneous thrusts more like a caterpillar track has instant traction rather than wheels that might spin and slip and so forth mm -hmm. and uh i may have missed this earlier but the the energy efficiency of this undulating system uh fin can be greater than that of the traditional propeller correct and if that is the case, would there be an energy efficiency um, application as to why industry would want to shift towards using more of these undulating fins? Yes, that, that could be the case. So we, in a very early test we did, of a very early prototype, before we built the robot that, that some of you have seen, we found only one uh, propeller thruster that was similar in static thrust per watt. And since that time, we've advanced the fin uh, significantly. So it's probably more efficient than any existing propeller for a you know, small propeller. You have to keep the scale in mind. Um, 
in terms of energy efficiency, I could could I could foresee energy efficiency being a reason to equip a ship or some other any kind of uh, aquatic vehicle or marine vehicle with this thruster, um, but we haven't scaled them up yet, so we don't know for certain that a very large undulating fin on a large vehicle would give you the same results. We don't have we have we can propose that it would, but we don't. Uh, we don't have the data yet on that. Mm -hmm. And um, loop, looping back to the robot, um, is the robot autonomous? Uh, is it remotely operated? Yeah, this robot, the one that people have seen, is is remotely operated. It can be remotely operated, uh, you know, wirelessly um, through radio connection or through the through a tether. The next step, and this is what the Navy is really looking for, the next step is to make it autonomous. We have, uh, when this work starts, we anticipate it will start next year with the Office of Naval Research. Um, we would like to do the autonomy all in-house and maybe we could, but we're going to team up with MIT. Uh, we have our, our proposal with the Office of Naval Research has a subcontract with MIT's uh, autonomy lab because they have some people that are, that are the best in the world at uh, marine autonomy. We're gonna collaborate with them when the program starts. Uh, most likely next year, and we'll have some of the work will be done in house. But we're just going to try to uh, not do everything ourselves to make progress as quick as we can. We're going to bring in um, some people with expertise. There's two people in particular, two professors that have expertise that's really unmatched. So we're going to take advantage of that rather than try to do everything ourselves. Although we feel like we could do it all ourselves, um, but we want to try to accelerate the pace. Mm -hmm. And a unique feature of this system is that it can both generate electricity, generate its own power, as well as move itself. So if this robot becomes autonomous, is it now able to stay submerged underwater, generate its own electricity, and not have that need to come up to charge? Yes, that's correct in principle. That's one of the, another of the key advantages of this system and harks back to its origins as an energy harnessing technology. So the fins are, are, are good at harnessing flow as well as effectively dissipating energy to create efficient thrust. So yes, a, and I think that's another area of interest that the, uh, the Navy has is persistent presence. Persistent presence is a, is a key topic uh, in the Navy at the moment. So to be able to tether ourselves in a flow, recharge our own batteries, there's, there's some obvious advantages there. I will say that there has to be a flow. So, in, in, and the robot has to be able to tether itself, fix itself relative to the flow. So obviously a river is gonna be simple, a stream, tidal flow is straightforward. When you get out into the deep ocean, it's going to rely on deep ocean currents. Some of them that can be very fast in, in some areas of the world, but it will need deep ocean currents. Of, of a, we've got it to, to start generating at about 0.5 meters per second flow of water. Um, and that's a really key advantage that a traditional propeller driven system just doesn't have because these small propeller blades don't have enough surface area to harness enough kinetic energy to move the electric motor in reverse, which is essentially, you know, making into a turbine. Whereas we have these very large surface areas, inherently large surface areas. So that gives us a large enough capture area to be able to capture the flow. Um, we think about 0.5 meters per second, it can start generating electricity so an, an underwater vehicle with very large propellers could in principle uh, have enough surface area for that slow flow of water to recharge its own batteries, but very large propellers are, are impractical for various reasons. And they'd also need two propellers side by side rotating opposite direction. Otherwise the propeller is gonna spin the vehicle in a, in a flow. So the reaction force of the propeller has to have something uh, to counter it. it, has to be a reaction force to counter the the, uh, the rotation of the propeller. So you need two propellers like a Chinook helicopter in opposite directions for the, for the vehicle to charge itself. Whereas we have a self-reacting mechanism. So the fins are reacting against each other rather than against some, uh, some external fixing point in order to, to get the torques to turn the motors, charge the batteries. And you mentioned deep ocean, and actually that brings up an interesting point. Uh, how deep can this robot go? Can this robot dive down to the actual depths of the ocean? 
Yeah, so the robot that you've seen is not depth rated. So it's not going to be going down into the bottom of the sea, but it can be made, uh, it can be made um, deep sea capable. And the engineering challenges of deep sea uh, technology are sort of universal. There's nothing about our platform that is inherently any easier or harder to make capable of withstanding great depths. And the engineering problems around depth are pretty well worked out at this point by the oil and gas industry primarily. And there is no reason why our system couldn't be made to withstand great depths. We haven't done that work yet. Mm -hmm. And another question. Firstly, I'm wondering what all the sensors that the robot is using to um, understand the world around it. And also, how is this robot able to localize its position and orientation as it's going through multiple different environments? Yeah, that is a, that is a, a, uh, a good question. And we have a whole array of sensors uh, and, and solutions for how to make that, make that happen. There are, there are many ways to approach it. And, and there's a whole menu of different sensors you can put on at any vehicle like this. We share the same challenges as other marine robotic companies in this regard. And there are new sensors and new technologies coming out all the time. And uh, what the final combination of sensors and software platforms uh, is not yet been determined. And it, it changes quite frequently. Things that we were considering a couple of years ago have now been, uh, have been superseded by, by, by uh, new technologies. Mm -hmm. Are there any that are um, not gonna change, such as uh, maybe having a camera in there to record video, gyroscope, accelerometer? Yeah, the current robot has an accelerometer. It has a couple of cameras, uh, it has a compass, um, so, it, you know, there will be IMUs, there will be uh, a whole variety of sensors in the final, uh, in the final, um, final products. And, and as time goes by, the, the, the combination of sensors, uh, you know, will, will evolve and will change. Um, we do have to, we do want to keep our, our, our weight limit down. Weight is not a problem in the water, but for the amphibious capability, too much weight, it makes it more difficult for the fins. So we are sort of watching as you know, every few months there's a new sonar that's come out or a small lightweight LIDAR uh, that's come out. So we're looking for compact versions of a lot of these familiar technologies uh, as they come out, as they roll out, as they have been very, very, uh, very rapidly to get as many sensors as we can in a small and lightweight package as we can to make our autonomy uh, as effective as it can be. Autonomy in the deep ocean is challenging because you don't have GPS and you have very low bandwidth communication. So you can't have data streaming to and from a vehicle if it's at any depth at all, other than through a cable. And there are, but there are some new technologies that appear to be close to being released, high bandwidth uh, acoustic modems, for example. They hold a lot of promise. We haven't seen them yet. But if, for the most part, when you're down in the ocean, you're by yourself. It makes autonomy not only challenging, but it makes it very necessary, right? You can't, on land, you know, a driverless car is constantly streaming data to and from other vehicles and to, uh, whether it's 5G, 3G, it's got uh, a GPS and so forth. But none of that is available in the ocean. So at least below the surface. So autonomy is very challenging, but also essential if you want to have a vehicle do anything by itself, it has to be very good at doing things by itself. Where autonomy will come into its own, where the real advances in autonomy will be made, might well be in undersea applications because you absolutely have to have them down there. Uh, whereas on land, you have all these things that can supplement the information that your vehicle has on land because of the, the ability to transmit signals to it and from it. Mm -hmm. And do you view the high bandwidth acoustic modems um... First off, could you describe a little bit what those exactly are? And do you view that as being able to potentially solve the problem of not having, you know, GPS specifically available underwater? Uh, I, I don't think it solves the problem entirely. It enables a human being to interact with the underwater vehicle if you can really have uh, high bandwidth acoustic modems. Um, I will say there are people that are skeptical that the high bandwidth acoustic modems being discussed now are ever going to be what, what the, the researchers claim they're going to be. So I'll put that as a caveat. 
but if someone has GPS, um, unless you know, there's something on the surface is connected to GPS and communicating with the robot, that's a way to get GPS. But the GPS signal won't penetrate through the water, obviously. But you have a station at the surface communicating with an acoustic modem to the robot, um, then that's one way to get uh, position in, in the ocean. But I, I don't know if this technology is really going to materialize in the way that people hope it will. Also, in, there's a, it, underwater, you're really in three-dimensional. So you don't just need to know where you are two-dimensionally as a, a land vehicle would, but you need to know where you are, obviously, in terms of the depth and the commitment. So you've got the X, Y, Z axis. You need to know where you are in, 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 in every axis, which is not the case for, for land vehicles. And that's an extra challenge. There are a lot of early autonomous vehicles that have, um, that have failed because they've hit they've hit the bottom or they've hit there's a sea mount that's not well mapped and they just go right into the side of it. So that's a real that's a real challenge. And it's especially challenging in the surf zone where, where the waves are going up and down and the the, the sand or the beach is just a, a few inches or a few feet below the vehicle. It's very hard to um, you know, to use sonar at, at those small depths. So you have to use a combination of sensors and clever software for the robot to know what it's doing when it's bouncing up and down on the waves approaching the shore. And that's what we're going to be doing the next round of, uh, of Navy funded R&D, which we anticipate will start next year. All right, thank you. What are some of your short-term and long-term plans um, for Pliant? Well, for the robotic development, uh, we, are, uh, we are going to use the funding from the Navy to develop a robot for the surf zone, an amphibious robot in the surf zone. By working out uh, you know, there's a mechanical component to that, uh, and then there's the there's the sensor and software component to that work. The work we'll be doing with the Navy to develop that amphibious robot capable of uh, shallow water and coastal operations will, in the process of doing that, we will have a a solid robotic platform that we can use for for other things. Uh, and with the autonomy work, uh, our goal is to have a ubiquitously useful autonomous robot, aquatic robot. Uh, and we're also going to be working under that Navy program uh, on swarming capability. So whatever the Navy would like to use our platform for, whatever they have in mind, they don't usually tell us in any detail why they're interested, or what specific applications they're going to use the robot for. It will, the work that will be required to give them what they want uh, will give us a, a universally useful uh, marine robot that uh, with autonomy and ultimately with swarming capability. And now we have something that uh, we can see a whole range of uses for. And the one that most interests me is in the field of uh, deep sea ocean mining, which is a controversial subject. Uh, a lot of people are very concerned that mining in the deep ocean is about to begin. Uh, and we have our, our robotic uh, platform, we believe can provide a solution that will, will, will basically eliminate a lot of the fears people have uh, of, the, of environmental damage, of ecological damage. So that's really the, that's really the, big, um, the big step for us is something such as environmentally benign deep sea ocean mining. And in the process of developing those robotic systems for an application such as deep sea mining, we hope to take the next step to having a robot that's mass producible, uh, and then we can use them for uh, applications closer to home, such as um, coral reef planting, uh, seagrass uh, planting, um, scalp uh, fishing without trawling. Scalp fishing is does tremendous amount of environmental damage with the trawl nets that drag along the bottom uh, to collect the scallops, we foresee using swarms of our robots to individually pick up the scallops without harming any of the environment around them, place them in a basket to be raised to the surface. Thank you very much for speaking with us today. I really want to actually dig into those use cases um, a little bit more with you on another episode that we're running a little bit low on time. Um, but thank you very much for coming out. You're very welcome. 
Sadly, that brings us to the end of this episode. But don't despair, as always, we have plenty more to discover at robohub.org forward slash podcast, where you'll also not just find our podcast episodes, but a wealth of other tech and robotics news, features and videos. And if you're a regular listener who enjoys our podcast, you can also visit our website to find out more about supporting us through Patreon. For just a few dollars a month, you can become a supporter or patron of the podcast and help us to ensure we can continue to bring you exciting episodes covering cutting-edge research, industry developments, conferences and events. We will be back again with a brand new episode in about two weeks' time. Until then, goodbye! Fins with Robohub, the podcast for news and views on robotics.